Something sinister is creeping through the forests of Tasmania. What we saw was both disgusting and spectacular. It is grotesque. Teeth falling out, jaws breaking off, tumours protruding into eye sockets. Lethal. There must have been tens of thousands of devils dying in absolute misery. And without precedent. That's unheard of. Um, just not, just doesn't happen. It has sparked a major international investigation. We were stepping into the unknown, so we didn't know really what, what to expect. Touched on a nerve of worldwide anxiety. People are frightened of cancers. And has turned scientific theory on its head. Cancer is not contagious. You cannot catch cancer from someone else. One evening in 1996. Wildlife photographer Christo Baz sets out on a journey which will make history. He travels across the Australian state of Tasmania, an island the size of West Virginia, heading for an isolated forest in Mount William National Park. He's hoping to photograph the elusive nocturnal creature the Tasmanians call the devil. He lays his bait. And waits. But nothing in the world could prepare him for what walks in front of his lens. What he photographs looks like something out of a horror film. Suddenly, another grossly distorted Tasmanian devil emerges from the dark. And then another. What is happening in the forest of Tasmania? What is creating these disfigurements? Nick Mooney is one of Tasmania's top wildlife biologists and has studied the Tasmanian devil in the wild for 30 years. He is the first to see the photos taken by Christo Bars. My initial response when I saw the pictures was, uh, Christ, what the hell is that? That's, um, I've never seen anything like that before. Mooney sets out to investigate, heading for the site where the photographs were taken. He hopes to find the same devils as in the pictures. The photos Christo had got were truly spectacular. And I've seen a lot of disease and wildlife. I've seen a lot of injuries, a, a lot of deformity. And I've never seen anything like it. And all the hundreds of devils I've caught over the years. Mooney needs to trap the same animals so he can try to assess their affliction. This is where the disfigured devils were last seen. Mooney's given himself three nights to find them. I would have expected over the, the three nights I trapped with 20 traps to catch at least 15 uh, different devils. Tasmanian devils live within a fixed home range. They're carnivorous scavengers and have an acute sense of smell, detecting dead meat from over a mile away. So they're usually easily attracted to bait. But this trip is different. The days were very quiet um, compared to a normal trapping trip. In the end, I'd only caught three or uh, four different individuals instead of the 14 or 15 I was expecting to catch. And none of the devils he does catch show any sign of abnormality. I came back several times over the next few months, but much the same happened. And it seemed obvious to me there were certainly a lot less devils there than had been in the past. Why are there so few devils? Where are all the disfigured devils? Mooney only has the photographs to help him try and work out what's going on. 
his first hunch is some kind of chemical poisoning. There's a couple of chemicals that are misused um, to kill devils. We know there's a potential for very dangerous chemicals to produce a mutation of some sort. But Mooney leaves Mount William with no answers. He has no proof. The fact that it was found by chance leaves a whole lot of questions unanswered. Is it just in devils? How many devils? We hoped it was uh, some isolated case, some freak disease, uh, just in that time and place. Uh, that was what we'd hoped. For three years, there are no further sightings of disfigured devils until 1999. A zoologist, Dr. Manor Jones, travels to Little Swanport, 225 kilometers from where the photographs were taken. Jones has made Tasmanian devils her life's work. I've been in love with the devil and wanted to be a zoologist ever since I could spell the word when I was seven or eight years old. The Tasmanian devil is unique to Tasmania and is the island's unofficial mascot. It is a rural cleaner, playing a vital role in the ecosystem by devouring carcasses that might otherwise lead to disease. But the devil has few friends. It steals livestock. Has a spine-chilling screech and is a legendary fighter. It's no surprise that early settlers on the island called this nocturnal beast the devil. Jones makes regular field trips, researching devil behavior and their population patterns. But this trip is unusual. I was on a two-day field trip to collect samples. The first animal I got, I thought, oh, that's a, a strange-looking lump. Never seen that before. They were bizarre. To me, they didn't look life-threatening. As Jones continues along her trap line, she finds more and more devils with these bizarre growths. By the end of that day, I caught eight devils with these lumps. They were just a couple of centimetres to eight centimetres across. They were big. Some of them were just a bit ulcerated, but they weren't really horrible. It's not unusual for Tasmanian devils to be scarred and ulcerated. Their fierce fighting often results in lumps and infections. And it was just lodged in the back of my mind as an isolated incident that was weird. It's not until two years later, in a different location, that Jones realises there could be something more serious going on. 2001, Fresenay Peninsula. 80 kilometres from Little Swanport. Manor Jones is on another field trip, researching devil behaviour. I was out there by myself for two days, and it was a very long trap line going into quite a remote area. And I wanted to catch 40 devils in two or three days. I detected these three cases up the very northern end, and they were horrific. These devils are covered with devastating injuries. Teeth falling out, jaws breaking off, tumours protruding into eye sockets. One of them we euthanised on humanitarian grounds. He had a 12 to 14 centimetre diameter tumour that was completely open and raw flesh, and it was just horrific. What or who could have caused such injury? Jones sends the euthanized devil to the lab. It's now five years since Christo Bars took pictures of the first disfigured devils at Mount William. 
These are the first tissue and organ samples to be tested. Thank you. Chris. Thank you. I've got the whole spleen here. What other bits are we looking for? The brain, skin, skin, bone marrow. Bone marrow. The very first samples I sent up in 2001, they found round cells that were consistent with a soft tissue lymphoma. Soft tissue cancer. It's given the name Devil Facial Tumour Disease, or DFTD. It's a new strain of cancer. The fact that there was no record of this sort of disease um, showed us we had a new problem. Uh, devils seem to have a new problem. Tasmanian devils have been found with a new kind of cancer. Three different locations, same disease. But where has this cancer suddenly come from? All options were on the table. Nothing had been discounted. Nobody knew whether this was a cancer that had arisen due to some chemical toxin in the environment through radiation, through a virus or, or, or what it was. There was a wide range of possible suspects. The idea of radiation was soon discarded, as there are no nuclear plants on Tasmania and no reports of other animals being affected. Chemicals used in the environment are a prime suspect. A list of something like 30 or 40 chemicals was identified and agreed as being um, worth investigating. Tasmania is famous for its beautiful rural landscape. Forestry and farming cover half the island, and the use of chemicals is common. There are some uh, chemicals that are, uh, under some circumstances, are known carcinogens used in the environment here um, as pesticides or herbicides. And there's been controversy over the use of those chemicals. The practice of extermination by poisoning is also considered. For Tasmanian farmers, the devil is a pest because it steals chickens and lambs. Tasmanian devils are protected and it's illegal to kill them, but it still happens in some areas. People have laced the bodies of a sheep or a wallaby with strychnine to kill large numbers of Tasmanian devils. There's cocktails of chemicals. There's not just single chemicals, there's combinations of chemicals. And in the area where this disease was first found, we know this persecution of devils has gone on. But the area where the disease was last found is a national park. The nearest farm is too far away for illegal devil poisoning to be the cause. Cancer has been found in three different locations by chance, and it doesn't seem as if these locations are linked. I was increasingly worried at how we managed to find this disease here and there by chance. No one knows if this disease has affected devils in other parts of Tasmania. In mid-2003, Nick Mooney decides it's time to act. We did a statewide snapshot survey. We randomised grids around the state and uh, surveyed them as quickly as we could. because We wanted to have accurate information on what this disease meant to devil population. Over the next few months, Mooney surveys tens of thousands of square kilometres and sets hundreds of traps. He begins to receive information from the public People were starting to uh, phone in and say, oh, I saw a sick devil or um, I saw a devil and it's dead on the side of the road at such and such a place. And we found this disease in all sorts of places. 
and uh, rapidly started filling out the map. The survey reveals the disease has spread over a third of Tasmania. There must have been tens of thousands of devils dying in absolute misery. And that, that's, a, uh, that's a very sad state of affairs. The survey also shows that the cancer is unlikely to be caused by chemicals, as it is found in areas where no chemicals are used in the environment. This disease was so widespread, and it was in places where there'd been no use of these chemicals that we might be thinking about. That meant that we thought, yeah, there's something really odd about this disease. The only common factor in every situation was that there were Tasmanian devils there, and it seemed that uh, the disease was just spreading inexorably where there were Tasmanian devils. This is serious. What is it? We've got to find out fast and we've got to try and do something about it. Nick Mooney's survey alerts Tasmania to the serious danger faced by its most iconic species. Nick Mooney was, I believe, um, really heroic in the early stages of responding to the disease by making a case to the uh, state government, to the Premier of Tasmania, that this was something that couldn't be ignored. It was something new, different and, uh, and spectacularly horrific. Seven years after the first photographs of mutant devils were taken, the Tasmanian devil hits the headlines. Interest can almost um, explode overnight, and that's really what happened. Suddenly there was more interest in devils, and that quite quickly moved into politicians making decisions, um, the government producing money, and there we have our project off and running. In 2003, the Tasmanian government launches an official investigation, and the Save the Devil project is born. By the stage we get funding, is now more than seven years after the first discovery. Immediately, a crack team is recruited to solve the mystery of the devil facial tumour disease. We started to choose monitoring sites, get staff on, start the diagnostic work in the, the animal health labs. It got ramped up rapidly. There's a sense of enormous urgency to all this. We can't get everything done fast enough and we feel as though we're running out of time. Tasmanian devils are being struck down by cancerous tumours. No one knows how, no one knows why. The Save the Devil campaign sets up a laboratory with new state-of-the-art equipment. Uh, four tumours were found, or at least three. And a team of experts is brought in to solve the mystery of this new strain of cancer. It's rare that a veterinary pathologist has the opportunity to study from scratch a totally new and emerging disease. Okay. Eyes down. They had to be thorough, they had to be rigorous, and they had to uh, look at every possibility. Gosh, this is an aggressive tumour. Radiation, pest control, and chemical pollutants have been discounted. I've been at this game for 35 years, and I've never seen anything quite like this. The next line of inquiry is whether the cancer could be caused by a virus. In recent history in Australia with diseases in koala bears and uh, other native wildlife, often viruses have been found to be involved. A virus is an infective agent whose genetic material invades cells, whereas cancer begins with a mutation of a cell's own genetic material. There is no such thing as a cancer virus but viruses have been known to cause mutations in cells to make them more likely to become cancerous. Immunologist Dr. Greg Woods decides to test the devil's immune system, the body's first line of defense against something like a virus. For these tumors to grow, you suspect that there must be something wrong with their immune system. Often when cancer develops, it's escaped our immune response. The Tasmanian devil, we don't understand much about their immune response. So we were stepping into the unknown, so we didn't know really what, what to expect. So everything was new. Did an autopsy to make sure they had their, all the immune organs. And the shoulder blades. Lymph nodes, spleen, and they had these organs in normal numbers. So they had the apparatus to induce an immune response. Take a bit of kidney. 
going in the big pot. The other important thing that we did was um, to do blood smears, just to make sure the devil has got all the normal immune cells present in his blood. That's good colour. And they did. They had all the normal white cells in normal numbers. The devil's immune system looks in good shape. Now they need to see if it works. Woods injects the devil with alien blood cells to see if its immune system attacks them. So we immunised four devils with red blood cells. We actually chose horse red blood cells. Injected them under the skin and looked for the antibody response. And to our surprise, not only did they produce a good immune response, they produced a, a fantastically high immune response. The antibodies they produced were extremely high, much higher than we expected. Tasmanian devils need a strong immune response to survive in the wild. They are the forest cleaners, devouring carcasses littering the landscape. When you think about it, the, the Tasmanian devil is going to expose a lot of bacteria, particularly as they're the devouring carcasses. Also, the devils do fight quite a bit and they do cause massive wounds. If you're diving into a carcass with massive wounds, the chance of infections are very high. So you need to be able to protect yourself against these infections. A strong immune system indicates the disease is unlikely to be a virus. But if their immune system is so strong, how are all the devils getting this cancer at the same time? We then had to sort of explain why does this tumour get transplanted from animal to animal? This shouldn't happen. Cancer is not contagious. You cannot catch cancer from someone else. So something unusual was happening within these Tasmanian devils. Tasmania's Save the Devil campaign hits a roadblock. It needs help. A retired scientist, Dr. Anne-Marie Pierce, comes to the rescue after hearing about the problem on the news. My first reaction was I was devastated, horrified, upset, distressed, and felt an incredible amount of sympathy for these animals. And uh, I thought, I can help with this. So I rang them up and told them that, that I was just the very person they needed. And so they made me a job. Pierce has unique qualifications. Not only is she a specialist in human cancer, she is also a zoologist with a history of studying Tasmanian devils. It was serendipity. It was as though my whole life had just been getting me ready for this one thing. And I'm pretty old, so that's a lot of getting ready. January 2004. Almost eight years since Christo Bars took the photos of mutant devils which sparked this investigation. Three years since the discovery of a new kind of cancer. Pierce starts work. I can't find a perfect one. Two things emerged right away, straight away when I started here. The first one was seeing the distribution of the disease around the devil's face. It was on the mouth, in the mouth, around the face. The second point was I happened to be looking at some slides of an animal who had a tumour on the lip here and another little tumour just opposite on the lower lip. And it looked very much like this tumour had caused that tumour, if you like. Then one day I was taking my dog for a walk and she had an argument with another dog and they locked jaws like that. So my dog was bitten on the soft palate and I thought that, that could just be what happens with the devils. I said it could be transmitted 
just by cell implantation from devil to devil. That's unheard of. It just doesn't happen. But I didn't have any proof at that stage. Pierce is suggesting this cancer might be contagious. I think when Anne-Marie first talked about that possibility, um, uh, for many people it was a ludicrous idea. Uh, cancers just aren't infectious. Next, Pierce looks for clues in the chromosomes, the body's blueprint found within each cell. Cancer is a mutation of a body's own cells, which multiply unchecked. So cancer chromosomes should be identical to its host's chromosomes. Here we go, that's not too bad. When I finally got to look at the chromosomes in the cancer, I found that they were the same in every animal I looked at. Come on. It was almost as if these tumour cells were clones of the same cell. Pierce's theory has no scientific precedent. Other people were sceptical. There, there were people who didn't quite understand what I was saying. Some sort of blob there that's sort of... Uh -huh. Pierce had to be 100% certain. Oh, look, I spent days. Um, in the original case, um, I had to look at so many to convince myself that it was right. The proof comes when she examines the chromosomes of a devil named after the famous Tasmanian, Errol Flynn. We called him Errol. We like famous Tasmanians to be the namesakes for our devils. Errol is an unusual devil. Let's have a look at that under high power. Chromosomes usually come in matching pairs, but one of Errol's chromosomes is abnormal. In other words, Errol had been born with one chromosome that wasn't right. Ah, that's a good one. So this is Errol's chromosomes. His two chromosomes, five, didn't match. One of them looked normal, the other one looked abnormal. So when you put them together, they didn't match up. They should always match up. According to known scientific theory, Errol's damaged chromosome should be present in his cancer. But when we looked at his cancer, this is what his cancer chromosomes look like. Hmm. Very nasty. Lo and behold, it was exactly the same as everyone else's cancer. So that damaged or unusual chromosome wasn't in the cancer. If Errol's damaged chromosome is not in his cancer, then his cancer could not be a mutation of his own cells. Now that meant that there is no way his tissues could have produced that cancer. So therefore, he had caught the cancer from somebody else. That was the proof, the final proof, that it was a contagious cancer. It was the only explanation for what we were finding in the chromosomes. There was nothing else that could have caused what we were seeing. Pierce makes history. This discovery by Anne-Marie Pierce was quite astounding, that she was prepared to think that uh, something that was previously almost unheard of was possible in this case. Well, I was a little bit excited. In fact, um, I have been described as having been a little bit overexcited. This is really the very first occasion where there is a very malignant cancer transmitted between animals that is life-threatening and it does kill the devils. The island of Tasmania has a cancer wreaking havoc throughout its most iconic species, the Tasmanian devil. It's the first fatal contagious cancer ever recorded in man or beast. But where did this cancer come from? So these were just cells of a cancer 
that had grown in one devil and become transmissible. So even though the devil probably died many, many years ago, its cancer was still going in other devils. The devil which originally had this cancer is now dead and has probably taken the secret of how it got it to its grave. Perhaps there's a chemical that's causing this, but it's also likely that we'll never know. We don't know the reasons uh, for most human cancers. We know how the cancer operates, but we don't actually know what caused it. Whenever it was, and whichever it was, this devil has left a terrible legacy. And the implications of its cancer are extremely disturbing. There are three possible outcomes from this, these transformations that are happening to it. The first one is that it could become less lethal. The second outcome is nasty. It could transform into a disease that is even worse. The third possible outcome is even worse. It could transform into something which would be capable of jumping from the devil into other species. Now that would be a very bad outcome indeed. The first task is to work out how the cancer is transmitted from devil to devil. We knew viruses weren't involved and chemicals weren't involved. It was a transmissible cancer. So then we had to start to explain why this cancer can be transmitted from devil to devil. It shouldn't happen, but it was. Is it something to do with their behaviour, or could it be hereditary? Is this disease handed on from mother to young? The obvious thing to a few of us was, well, let's get some diseased mothers with young, and we'll keep them and see what happens to the young over the next few years. Got a bruise on the nose, but looks perfect. She can go. Uh, now those young are over three years old and they still haven't developed a disease. Not only is it not hereditary, young devils aren't getting the cancer at all. You expect mortality to be much higher in juveniles than it, than it is in adults, but this disease was going through the adult population. In the early days we didn't see any, any juveniles at all with the disease. Um, and that was strange. That was really strange. The investigators turn their attention to adult devils. So we've got all threes for more eruption. Almost certainly there had to be uh, contact between devils or fresh devil material. Full-grown Tasmanian devils are famous fighters. Their ferocity is legendary, particularly when it comes to food. Once these scavengers find a carcass in the forest, it's a feeding frenzy. They've got absolutely disgusting table manners and what they'll do is they'll fight over carcasses. Pound for pound, Tasmanian devils have the most powerful bite in the world, designed for ripping open carcasses and crushing bones. We've watched them fighting at carcasses. And if you've got a devil with a tumour in it, he's got this target, and it's called a big, red, open, ulcerating tumour. So if you're going to bite the other devil, you bite that fascinating lump of raw flesh that's sticking out. We know this cancer is very fragile, friable, and bits can fall off it. So there's lots of opportunities for a, a devil with a big tumour to be eating, tumour cells fall on the carcass, another devil, contacts those cells, perhaps gets a cell into a cut in its mouth, and away you go. The devils could be infecting each other at mealtimes, but this is not the full story. The cancer is spreading just as easily in areas with very few devils. So few, they're unlikely to have to fight over carcasses. This finding shifted the inquiry from feeding to breeding. Devil courtship is also very violent. During the mating season, males will rip whole chunks of flesh off each other's cheeks. You can get areas two, three centimetres in diameter. 
So you can imagine a, a devil with tumour cells on its teeth. Penetrating bite inoculates tumour cells right inside the skin. About 85% of tumours are on the head and 85% of bites are on the head and it's mostly adult males and females. So juvenile devils are not getting, are not sustaining serious skin penetrating injuries. The devils are injecting each other with cancer through their biting. Sex and food, the fundamentals of life, are instruments of death. Once the devil is infected, it's got the disease and it can't get rid of it and it will die from the disease within 12 months, usually within three months. But if this cancer is so contagious, why is it caught only by devils? No other species has been found with the disease. There must be a missing link. What is it about devils that they, their immune system doesn't seem to recognise these cells from another devil? And that's the really important question with this disease, is why does not the devil's immune system recognise it as non-you? The answer lies in history. Tasmania's isolation is both a blessing and a curse. On the Australian mainland, the devil is believed to have been wiped out by dingoes over 400 years ago. The island is the last devil outpost. But for over a century, devils were hunted and poisoned by farmers. Most Tasmanians had a very um, poor attitude to devils. Uh, most Tasmanians couldn't care less if they died out. Not a very um, positive attitude at all. By the 1930s, their numbers had fallen to a dangerously low level, and killing devils was outlawed in 1941. Now, when they started to build up again, because they started with a very low number of devils, we obviously got quite a lot of inbreeding. It's a very inbred population and that this has made them more susceptible to uh, the kind of disease that we've seen appear. Inbreeding means devils are genetically alike, so their immune systems recognise the infectious cancer cells as their own cells and don't fight them. If the devils were more genetically dissimilar, the cancer cells would appear to be alien and their immune systems would respond. Most of the devils here are very closely related, so the wrong disease can go right through the population, and that's what we're seeing. It's like having an invader into an army who's wearing the same uniform, just you know, invades quite, quite easily. It's not, not detected. The mystery of the mutant devils is solved. The aggressive nature of the devil is to blame for the spread of the cancer. Inbreeding is the reason that the disease is not rejected by the devil's immune system. And the cancer's rigorous nature is the cause of their rapid demise. And this disease was just waiting in the wings. It was out there. And we were able to have an epidemic. That's the epidemic of DFTD. Devil's facial tumour disease has now spread over two thirds of the island. Overall numbers have dropped from over 100,000 down to 30,000. In some places, devil numbers are down 90%. We have to expect the worst can happen. An island is a, a very finite place, and extinctions have a very nasty habit of occurring on islands, and um, we don't want to be part of an extinction here. We are facing the prospect of this magnificent animal going extinct. The ultimate challenge is next. How to save the devil. The investigators have solved the mystery of devil's facial tumour disease. They have made history, discovering the world's first contagious fatal cancer. But the case is far from closed. 
there's a great public expectation that um, given all the interest we'll find a cure for this or something but we always remind people of um, how many cures do we know for human cancers. The devil's future is in the balance. How long has the devil got until it becomes extinct in the wild in Tasmania? The best estimates at the moment are something between 15 and 25 years uh, if current trends continue. Thinking we find, we'll find a cure to this within the time frame we need to is highly unlikely. With no cure in sight, the focus turns to saving the Tasmanian devil before cancer wipes out the species. Scientific officer Billy Lazenby works in the field, monitoring the steady march of the disease across the island. She is a first-hand witness to the horror. There's nothing there to stop it wiping out the entire population. Oh, wow, this, this guy's massive. So we'll have a look at his face now. Oh, doesn't look too good. If we have a close look in here and lift the lip up, we can actually see that the tumour is ulcerated and open. It's, it's quite horrific, the impact that this disease has on populations. We're probably not going to get some fantastic cure just drop from the sky overnight. He's a little bit apprehensive to leave his sack. So the devils that we observe with the disease, um, you know, within three to five months of showing the first tiny initial little signs, they will have disappeared from the population. So the end is always the same. They die from it. I'd like to say it's good to release a devil, but um, unfortunately I don't think his prospects are that good, so we'll see how he goes. The only sort of real active forms of managing this disease are bringing in um, disease-free devils from the wild and keeping them in quarantined captivity, or attempting to suppress the disease by removing all of the diseased devils from within an enclosed population. The Save the Devil campaign invests in an environmental insurance policy. To prevent the devil from becoming extinct, they need a population of healthy animals. Isn't he gorgeous? Once we discovered this disease was 100% mortality, we thought if things go really badly here, we're going to have to reconstruct this population at some stage yeah. in the future because wild devils are only in Tasmania and we, we really only get one shot at doing this right. Firstly, the team creates a sufficient supply of disease-free devils in captivity. Seemingly healthy devils are put in quarantine for two years to ensure they don't develop the disease. Then they're sent out of the danger zone and into secure places such as zoos on mainland Australia. Our nightmare was uh, to send um, perhaps the last healthy devils from Tasmania to the mainland and then find that one of them was diseased and the disease was spread into that uh, captive population. But no one wants to see the last Tasmanian devils behind bars in a zoo. Captive animals are only half the answer. Our next phase was to see if we could do anything about the disease in wild populations. Mena Jones has an ambitious plan, to establish a population of healthy devils and keep them quarantined in the wild. Disease management is all about breaking the transmission cycle. We've got to break transmission from devil to devil. She chooses an isolated peninsula in the southeast, linked to the mainland only by a bridge. This is the best chance of keeping the healthy devils in and the diseased devils out. Look, at the moment, I just desperately hope we can make it work. At the moment, it's our only tool for managing the disease in wild populations. 
He's 10.2. Ecologist Christine Puck has the task of weeding out the disease devils on the peninsula. Okay, let's have a look at your sexy end, eh? She's trying to artificially engineer a survival of the fittest. Sometimes you find tumours around the lips here, up under the gums. You get the gingival tumours, which are quite red. Look like one of those raspberry lollies. But sometimes it feels she's fighting a losing battle. The number of disease devils she finds is increasing. First day trapping back here, there was 13 animals sitting there waiting for the vet to turn up. And that was, that was more than I'd pulled out the whole year prior to that. It's also her job to take the disease devils to be euthanized. That long, slow, journey in the back of the car to meet the vet, it's horrible. It's tough because you feel like you're breaking their trust, you know, they, they're, they're such gentle creatures to work with. I'll die anyway, you know, it's a, it's a mercy killing I suppose. The quarantine programs are desperate last measures and there are no guarantees. This disease I believe could cause extinction of the species because there is a certain point in, in, in a population of any animals where if it gets below that, it can't recover. By 2007, the cancer has crept over most of the island except the west coast. It may only be a matter of time before the devils in the west succumb to the fatal disease. Can we halt the, pro the spread of the disease across the landscape? And I think the answer is realistically no, not even if we had a million dollars. Not even if we had $20 million, we probably couldn't do it. It is a new disease. The investigators need new solutions. <laughs> 2007, immunologist Greg Woods begins a new line of inquiry. If the reason the cancer can jump between devils is their genetic similarity, he needs to find a devil with a genetic difference. And what was discovered was that the devils within the eastern half of Tasmania, their genes involved in the immune response are very, very similar, whereas in the western half, they're, they're slightly, slightly different. Woods takes a healthy devil born in quarantine from the western half of the island. He calls him Cedric. He injects Cedric with devil facial tumour disease cells to see how his immune system reacts. OK, that's done. And what we found was that Cedric produced an antibody response to the tumour. This was the very first indication that a devil could produce an immune response against DFTD. We had to look at it two or three times to make sure it was true. And it was true, the antibody was produced. So Cedric has produced an immune response, which indicates that there are devils out there which have the potential to respond to the tumour. Because Cedric came from the northwest, their genes just happened to be just enough different to induce an immune response. Cedric is our, is our ray of hope. In 1996, a photograph changes the course of history. Ten years later, a scientist reveals that the Tasmanian devils have the world's first fatal transmissible cancer. Over that decade, the Tasmanian devil population has been decimated. The future of the species is in the balance. But if there are more devils out there like Cedric, then it might be possible to breed a whole new generation of cancer-resistant Tasmanian devils.